This is Nimbin. In previous videos I've discussed the northern communities in or the areas of northern New South Wales where there are alternative communities and Nimbin is part of that. Now I suppose you could say that each area sort of has its own subculture but connects in because uh, most of this town swells up on a daily basis with tourists that come in and most of them are international tourists that started off in Byron Bay and ended up because they heard about Nimbin and they've come over to check it out and I thought that Nimbin was as big internationally as its reputation is big in Australia but it isn't. Internationally Byron Bay is the big thing that that's what draws them in initially and they all hear about Nimbin and end up coming over. So um, there's a large part of this very small community that is survives on international tourism. Now it, you can see here where it was the home of the 1973 Aquarius Festival. It is a hippie town with hippie ideals, well mod modernised hippie ideals put it that way, not the same hippie ideals uh, I believe in anyway. But in 1973, when they were having this festival, I was eight years of age and I'd be walking down the street and I'd be seeing the flares and the hippies with their long hair and, you know, all their colourful um, clothes and beads and they'd put up their two fingers and they'd go, peace man. And sometimes I'd put up my two little fingers too and do peace man back, you know, it was kind of fun especially since it was grown-ups doing it to, to kids, you, they made you feel good. So, And that's one of those things that if um, I had someone complain to me because they reckon that I've got some Mayan voodoo symbol on my channel right now, and it's not, I don't know whether it's a Mandela effect or what, but... Um, you know the hippies when they hold their two fingers up and they go peace man they're actually imitating the peace sign that was round their neck that all you know so many of them they'd have this round thing round their neck and I even made quite a few of them with uh, different crafts and everything that I got into and my auntie got me into and she also made the peace symbol the the two fingers up is imitating the two up signs on either side of the peace symbol that is now turned upside down and looks like someone should be turning there instead of peace man with fingers up they should be down imitating legs so someone objected to me putting the um, peace symbol the way I know it and the way hippies used to imitate it with their two fingers to try and indicate you know the peace sign that was around their neck it, I didn't make this up this is what I experienced as a kid and I made it as a kid these things matched up so um, yeah this person said change it or else and I said or else what and he said oh, I'm going to unsubscribe and I said fine don't let the door hit you on the way out and he was pretty insulted by that but it's like I really don't understand how the peace symbol has been turned upside down. So, yeah, I didn't mean to get onto a, a thing like that, but it is the town of peace, and I went there with ideals of that peace. Now, the town itself has barely got 1,500 people. It's very small. I'll start up the video on it now so you can... This day I was walking into town, and I just took uh, photos of it as, as I was walking in. So the town itself has got about 1,500 people uh, with about 10,000 people according to the locals. They reckon there's about 10,000 people around the hills in 
alternative lifestyle communities. And that would only just be around this area. The community I've talked about in the in previous videos, I assume is more towards another central location rather than Nimbin because uh, the extent of these communities covers a large, large area and it's very rich with volcanic soils, uh, national parks, natural waters and a lot of those natural waters are good for fishing as well so there's a lot there. So even though the town is small it swells up to a lot of people every day and they do come in for largely a trade that um, goes untaxed. It <laughs> it's pot. Uh, there's a reason they time the annual festival just after harvest and everything's dried out so that, that you know a lot of people that you don't see in those hills they don't come into the the town only rarely on occasions there's a farmers market that they'll bring in organic produce to to try and sell and there's a couple of other reasons why people from not only just um, in the surrounding hills but in the larger area will come to Nimbin and especially for the Mardi Gras. So the one thing about the Mardi Gras I always said why are they green fairies? And I'd noticed it years ago and it wasn't one of those things that I really needed to look at too much because there's a lot of different characters and in individuals that express their themselves in different ways. So, you know, I was just looking at people expressing themselves. But when I moved to the town, um, I was told that it isn't actually Nimbin, it's Nimage. It, Nimbin was named after the Aboriginal word for Nimage and Nimage, the best translation f that we could understand, is something akin to a fairy and that's why they would have fairies and green fairies in the Mardi Gras parade because this whole town is named after the mythology of the Nimage. So that swells out once a year and a lot of communities come round that are um, in the larger area. That's a little bakery where I used to get my gluten free bread at. It was the only one that was edible because his daughter had gluten intolerance. And it's not something I've continued on with because it was something that happened after an accident and I nearly split my liver in two. I had pretty much 10 years while it all sort of came back to normal where there were a lot of things I couldn't eat. Anyway, that's off the subject. So it's a pretty small and quiet little town, but it does rely on the tourists that come in and most of those tourists are coming in to try a few of the local delights that the laneway boys dish out. and. To also, um, as you can see on the tops of all the buildings, there's lots of murals and there's lots of expression of different artistic communities. They've got a gallery there where they bring in all the, the local art. And they do try to promote local and sustainability, but a lot of these shops are, are bringing in things from other countries anyway they're not locally made they're just producing to a tourist market and there's also a fairly big um, local market that comes in from all over from southeast Queensland all around New South Wales for um, the local pot trade and uh, And because of the nature of this town and what goes on in there, they do get harassed a lot by the cops. And uh, when I was living there, I was, well, any time you go to the town, 
If you hear someone call taxi, now there's no taxis in the town. They call them a taxi because it's it's a lift that's going to cost you a lot of money. Um, that's what gets called out if if the cops are starting to do a raid. And it, it became such a problem for the cops to catch them that they had a few things in mind that were really going to, to change things for them. And I was in, uh, this happened back in 2014. And you know, just coming up, I think, is where, yes, the photographs where the museum and the cafe burnt down. I was actually, <laughs> um, I heard the sirens and I wondered what it was. And you could hear the, the crackling of the flames and everything, but it, it didn't really sound like fire. Well, I haven't heard fire that was like this anyway. It completely destroyed two buildings and it was what you'd call targeted. And targeted because uh, the laneway boys used to, um, when they called taxi, everybody would scatter and there were friendly places that offered um, many places where they wouldn't get into trouble or, you know, I mean, essentially the, the museum and the cafe were safe havens. And there was lots of, uh, especially in the museum, I mean, that were, you could have searched through there for a day and not found anything. And here they have, this is out the back where the, the laneway boys are, where people just come and go all day, getting different stuff off them. And without the cover of both the museum and the cafe, they were out in the open because there was a little laneway, that's why they were called the laneway boys, because there was a little laneway, it had beautiful trees there and a lovely little garden out the back. You could go from the cafe, you could sit there and have a coffee and just enjoy it. And there was lots of talk around town uh, from locals and everything that, uh, oops, I'm gonna stop it there because that's the next instance. Um, there was lots of talk about how it actually happened but essentially it was two months nearly to the day after that 52 police would seal off the town, storm it um, with dogs coming in from all directions and they also had a camera crew there ready to film it too so they, they had a whole agenda going but uh, yeah, I'll finish on the fire side of it anyway. So they had um, the arson attack there and it was an arson attack. See, the thing is that not everybody in the town, especially in some of the businesses that are just there to rip off the tourists and they will only sell pot to the tourists. So they, there's a competition in the town between those that will sell to locals that come in and those that operate their business and will only sell to tourists. And I, I see the thing is that uh, when people are like that in businesses and they don't know that I've been in that town and I do know the town very well and also the people in it and all the politics and the rivalry between, you know, the different factions in the town, this woman was talking about what she had actually done and what she had done led me to believe that the whole reason that the police showed up this day was in cooperation with not only information that she had given them but, but another business there as well. I could tell you who she is but I'm not going to name names because that that is just pointless at this stage to make um, to bring forward an opinion and to name someone as being guilty and not be able to prove it because I couldn't. 
it did make my jaw drop. It's, I thought, well, you wouldn't be saying that if you knew that I could go straight back and tell someone what I've just heard. But the thing is that I only knew a few people and my opinion didn't count for much. I wasn't, I'm not a forceful kind of person to have people listen to my opinion. So I might mention something and, you know, if they don't pay too much attention to it, I'm not going to go much further. So the arson was, for all intensive purposes, a, a deliberate thing and they were anticipating that something much, much bigger was going to come. And I have to say that this day was something bigger and it did change the town forever. The burning down of the museum and the cafe was, well, the cafe had really nice food in there and the people were really friendly. I mean, I don't care what side of my business they had going on. They were, a, it was a nice business with good food. So when that burnt down, it really deflated everybody in the community. I mean, it was, uh, it wasn't a big bushfire like we've had this year, but it had the same kind of mental effect. It really took out the heart of the community. It burnt out the heart of the community because that museum had pretty much irreplaceable uh, relics, I suppose you could call them. It was an Aboriginal museum and it represented a lot of the things that they had gone through over the years, through all the different facets of, you know, laws and how they were treated and everything. And it, it was a good way of bringing everything together. They had so much well, not relics, memorabilia, all these things that represented it and you could physically see. And that part of it was burnt out. Now, they, there was some talk about this guy that apparently they found sleeping and, yeah, there was a few different stories. But ultimately, my guess is that... Um, it was done deliberately, in coordination, to take away any means of escape and cover and friendly protection, I suppose you could say, so that they could actually, once and for all, get to the top and change things. Well, the top of where the laneway boys are anyway, and, uh, and they did this day, they... Um, they got people that they'd never been able to get anywhere near before and that after just going through the fire completely changed the dynamics of the community because um, you know the laneway boys dealt with tourists and locals and everybody they were friendly they were businessmen salesmen you know they were friendly whereas a lot of the shop owners if they didn't recognise you as a tourist, they they were in some, well. This one woman, she was always rude to you. The day when there was the hemp bar there, where yes, I walked in there and I sat down. I had a cup of coffee and I I rolled up what I bought up the back in the little from the guy up the back and sat down and did something I've never been able to do in public before. And I have to tell you, there was a kind of exhilarating freedom in that. Also, a kind of fear is like that even though I know that it's kind of tolerated, it's also not because this is where they focus all the attention on. And as someone said to me, you know, that people in Australia think that, you know, Nimbin's where all the drugs are. Well, it's not. There's more drugs in Mwoolumba and Byron Bay than there are in Nimbin. But Nimbin is the community that they focus on because I suppose largely for the reason why I ended up there because there are a lot of people that go there that want an alternative lifestyle and it attracts tourists. So it's a place where they want their presence or the cops' presence to be felt to make sure that, you know, that these are not choices that the general public want to make. Because as I said, that m most people in Australia, this is like Hippie Valley, you know, and, well, 
to international people, Byron Bay is that hippie place. And it's only once they get to Byron Bay and they're, they're in Australia that they hear about Nimbin and they rent a car and come on in and visit the place. Now this day that they came through, they, um, I'll just keep running that again. As I said, there was 52 of them. I was walking back, uh, I'd just been up to the shop, I was walking back and all of a sudden there was a whole bunch of cops rushing towards me with a dog and at first I, I thought, what? And they went rushing past me and I thought, oh, whoa, what's going on? And then all of a sudden you look around and there's just cops everywhere. And so I just started going around and videoing and taking pictures and uh, trying to find out what was going on and where it was going on. But it was a very well-coordinated um, raid of the town. There's a business to the left here that never got raided because um, that was the one where I was in where I believe she was part of instigating this coordinated attack because the ones that did get done are the alternative ones. These are little cafe, this little cafe down here is somewhere where you can sit and uh, quite often there's someone that's playing an instrument there and uh, also that uh, com uh, people that come from out of the larger North West New South Wales area also come there. I've seen one of the um, guys at another community, he comes in there with his artwork. They know that there are touros in there and also that woofers will be walking around trying to find a place to stay and to work to earn that stay as well. And this guy uh, would sit there in front of the shop and do his art and draw people in. He was re he's really good at it. And um, at the end of the day, he'd go home with at least one or two tourists or woofers. So it, it's also a place where they come in from the larger area to actually access the tourists that come in. And there's places all around where there are you know, notices left on windows to contact different people and things like that. And a lot of them are not going to advertise anyway because um, you've got to buy into them. They're not a do-drop-in kind of place, you know. They, they are businesses, as I've explained. So any of them that are advertising are pretty much farms that are looking for woofers. And they don't say that, or some of them do in the ads, but those that don't, and you ring up and they ask if you're a woofer and you say no, and they say, well, sorry, we're looking for woofers. And that's why I talked about woofers, is because this use of the international community and its redirection from Byron Bay over into Nimbin to then be picked up by those people that do come from these this larger area that come into Nimbin to meet all the tourists and then take them back to those various communities to be woofers at. I mean it's a, it's a constant source of woofers and tourists. So just as I was starting to bring it all together as one big thing I've run out of the photograph slides so I'm just going to run that again and there's other photos that I've put on there, so they'll just come in after while I'm talking about this. So I, I just didn't want to have you sticking on one image. You might find it boring. You might find the images more interesting than what I'm saying anyway. I don't know. But um, I wanted to bring how Nimbin is part of supplying the larger area with its woofers to these alternative lifestyle communities that have um, pretty much gone through all the prerequisites by the government and doing all the things necessary 
pretty much to have a woofer you need to be able to give them a bed for the you know the duration and a meal and that is pretty much the requirements and they have to in return for that do a, a certain number of hours of work for it so a lot of these places aren't looking for they've already got the accommodation they've got meals that they can provide they just want someone that will come in and do the work for them so in a lot of ways it's not really costing them any money they don't have to employ people so when they come from the this larger area into a place like Nimbin to find the woofers and the touros that might go out there and and even if they're not a woofer they might just be a tourist who wants to go and experience something I mean there's lots of different reasons that people come in and out and through of this area and the different communities I've met all different sorts uh, there's been a guy from Africa with his two young kids and he was a very spiritual man and I would have loved it if he had stayed at the community but I knew he wouldn't because well the community wasn't spiritual uh, where he went is where I probably should have gone but anyway that would be a different story and getting off the subject wouldn't it so the I was talking before about how oh, I haven't even started up how um, one of the guys from another community I met him and I also saw him in Nimbin as well where he would be on the sidewalk near the cafe there that I talked about just before and he'd be doing his Aboriginal art and he's really brilliant at it it's like uh, watching one of those uh, you know a creation go up before your eyes it's not something that you gotta wait days to see what the end result is you can quite literally watch him build the picture with the story you know and uh, he, he's a brilliant artist a really brilliant artist and he actually uh, comes from the community that I talked about uh, in a previous video that is also set up as a company I didn't realize it until I watched their nearly hour video of the the, the promo of the place and pretty much what to expect and I didn't realize that was the actual community that he was talking about so any time I would see him in Nimbin I would see him leave with um, backpackers whatever backpacker type of backpacker whether they were just traveling around or woofers I don't know but essentially they're going to be going back to the community with him and they're going to experience it and it's something that they encourage you know bring back all these pe people to experience this different lifestyle and uh, I've already gone into the um, darker side of that so I don't want to delve too much into the consequences of what these innocent people that have just you know jumped off a plane gone to Byron come to Nimbin and then been mesmerized by an ideal and followed through on it and wound up with a reality that wasn't ideal and I mean I how many of us find that in so much in life we have this ideal of something and then when we experience it for ourselves we find that the reality is a lot different and that's why I've tried to experience a lot of things in my life because I want to have things based on the reality of experience not the ideal that we hold because hiding holding ideals makes us judgmental of other people and because when we set ideals we expect others to meet them so and really uh, most of my ideals clearly have never been met because what I picture as an ideal is not what others do so these um, communities with their uh, international backpackers trade uh, a lot of them end up staying on working visas some of them actually get jobs around the local shops and 
they get on very well you know they love it so much they don't want to leave I met one guy there you know he was he um He went home to visit his parents in Italy and his mum said how skinny he was and he came back, he was nearly twice the size of what he was before he left because, you know, he got too skinny and thin and underfed while he was in Australia. But, you know, there's a certain appeal, even though there's that that element that, uh, you know, there. There's a lot of lost souls in this town, and it's kind of sad in some ways. But um, I want to bring it back to the communities, these alternative communities, and uh, the mind control aspect that I experienced in at least one of them, and what I've discussed in other things before, is that how far spread is it when I know that I've been told that every single one of them has been infiltrated and I suppose that's why a lot of them fail and why um, they might have expensive mishaps that for no reason they didn't know why it happened but it still costs them to fix and replace it I mean there are many ways that you can frustrate the efforts but I want to bring it back to the the communities now there's a large aspect that is involving the Aboriginal community the tribal law and the land and the heritage of the land and I'd have to say that no matter where you go what you want to do or who you are who owns the land and who controls the land is always going to be an issue and even when you know like here in Australia you own the land but if you wanted to build something on it you've got to get permission to build on there and if you built something that was you know some a neighbor was going to find it offensive that he might be able to see the top of it or something and I mean you cannot do with your own land what you want to and you are constantly paying rates on it as well too so the community that this artist this Aboriginal artist belongs to I've had a pretty good look into and there is the connection with not only this um, guy that I've given the pseudonym Morgan to in a previous video uh, he's not only involved in it, but he's also part of helping to establish this community. Now, I don't want to say too many negative things about what I experienced with some Aboriginals because it was some Aboriginals and they are certainly not representative of all of them and their behaviour was not something that is acceptable anyway but if you're a, a white person and there's a black person around and the black person's going to defend the other black person no matter what even if you're right so you know some some things you don't argue about so I'm saying this because I have upset some Aboriginal people with my attitude and because I was on their land and claimed under native title, um, I was pretty much told, you know, I could bury you, you'd be dead, and there's nothing that anyone could do about it. And why I say is that I don't want to bring up too many bad things about this, is that when I said it to another Aboriginal later, they said, well, yeah, you can do that under tribal law, but there are also other things that, you know, that if what you did wasn't justified, um, you could find yourself facing the same kind of thing that you dished out. And I thought, well, but, but it does make you think, because um, 
the police were called um, on a couple of occasions because of situations that arise. And if it's on native tidal land, they can't do anything. It doesn't matter what they do on that land. And that's if it's working under native title and tribal law, which the land that I was on at that time was. So uh, the only reason that the cops could actually come on to actually talk with me after I'd called them was because the elders allowed them to come on. They couldn't just drive on. But that that's another story how all that happened anyway. But the thing is that you're putting your hand, your life in the hands of someone that may decide that what you say isn't quite in line with their philosophy. And these people weren't looking after the land. They were shortly afterwards kicked out of there because it, it looked more like a tip than, than sacred land. But as I said, I don't want to get too much onto the negative because the ideal behind going back to the land and establishing that connection is something that I want to achieve. It's why I ended up in this place and why so many other people end up there. But who controls the land and who owns the land it is a really big factor. The only way that you could have a successful community where everyone was truly equal, and I've thought about this in oh, for so many hours, over so many days and months and years, how could you achieve it? And the only way to achieve peace in a community where people are truly equal to even start as equal to make base rules that we can all agree by is that there is the land ownership is completely not an issue there is no ownership on the land and no one that controls the land it has to truly belong to everyone or we belong to the land and in the sense of that this is the philosophy behind the Aboriginal um, we belong to country. Uh, we, well I'll read out uh, the, the Bunjalung one. We belong this country. We look after this country. Don't do wrong around this here this country. We don't harm this country here we belong to it, this country. And that was from the Bunjalung elders. So, from that very statement, and I mean, y you could go around, there's lots of um, different mob, clan, tribal, whatever you want to call them, uh, around Australia. Um, uh, they all have the same concept. And the same concept is, we belong to it, this country. In other words, the country owns them. They belong to it. it they don't own it. I mean, for many, many thousands, tens of thousands of years, we have had a, an essentially nomadic, culture that are small groups that are nomadic that the only thing that they own is what they carry around on their back with them now they did leave um, in sacred places there would be gathering places where they would come together as communities but there was a lot of and there still are a lot of different um, groups and they do clash with each other not only now, but historically well as well. I mean, you know, they're nomadic. They wander into someone else's territory and they say, you know, go away, this is ours. And it's like, yeah, we wander around in this bigger area and we, no, you can't come over here. So they end up in a fight over it. Uh, so there's all this, even though they're um, nomadic and they don't own the land, they never have owned the land. It's never been a concept to them to own anything. They belong to the country. They belong to it, the country. So in actual fact, the Aboriginal considers themselves owned 
by the com country. So the concept of ownership is only something that has come in in the modern era where it's it's a word that they can use. There was no word for ownership in Aboriginal. There is no word for ownership in Aboriginal. Belong, yes, but not own. So when you're talking about people that are setting up tribal law communities, some of them are set up as on native title land. They're not private hold land, like this community I'm talking about. They're on native title land and they're running their own laws. These communities here are a little bit different that I've been talking about because even though they might say they're reclaiming sacred sites, it is still land that they purchased, has owners and is also registered as a business. Now that business offers you to buy into it and uh, what they offer, just as a quick run over, they've already got pre-approved lots. They've got um, 3,600 acres of land and they have pre-approved lots that are 2.7 acre lots for sale and you have to clear one acre uh, that you build in and you can use the trees that you've built off uh, that you've cleared off that land to build with and uh, now it's also said too that uh, the trees that are cleared off that land remain the property of the community so um, you'd have to watch the video which I'd le I'll leave the video in the link because uh, there's this communal aspect of, bring of coming into it and even though you're buying in you're buying the 2.7 acres of land and you can build your house on it I mean if anyone's built under a covenant uh, this is pretty much the same thing but it goes a little bit deeper than just the covenant because the structure of this to allow that you can buy your 2.7 acres and buy into the company is um, uh, sorry I, I got distracted there and I lost uh, where I was heading with it so I'll just uh, get back on track with, with describing what these places require so um, you've got a 2.7 acre lot that you buy into and you can build your, your house on and you need to clear an acre of that for fire safety reasons and once you've built that house now you've bought into this now I um, referred to this guy Morgan in previous videos he said that um, you could take your superannuation and invest it in a place like this, you know, you could retire there. Now, the thing is that if that was something that you wanted to do with your superannuation, fair enough, but you should also consider that it is actually just taking it out of one place where it's invested and putting it into another place where it will be invested, where if that larger investment or that is that larger community happens to fail if something goes on and that whole community falls apart you will lose your component of it and you will lose everything else that you've got and not because uh, you will think okay I own the land it's mine I've got my own house I'm, I'm independent but that land still remains the property of the company, as does the house. So if something happens to the company, they can sell off anything and all assets of the company, which includes the land that you paid to, to buy into and the house that you built on it. So I, I just want people to be aware because these are, I mean, I know that 
I'm, I'm quite impressed with what they've actually achieved in this community. And I'm really hoping that um, the infiltrated elements that are in this community are not going to hold it back too much or uh, interfere with their efforts too much. That might end up because, I mean, it, you don't know that in this community where I was, that there were lots of little things that happened that just caused frustrating situations. It caused arguments between the, the brothers and the cousin and, you know, it cost money to fix and, you know, everyone's arguing over what caused it and, you know, it's somebody's fault, no, it's your fault. And, and it's like, yeah, well, you know, you, you've got to wonder, as I had said in previous videos, that all it takes is you know someone that's got ill intent to just like when the water pump failed what happened to that i mean i could almost imagine this guy um alan that i knew back then this guy that told me he was the mk ultra operative um, i could just imagine him doing that uh, sabotaging it and then no no it wasn't me and another thing that comes into it too is that, and why I explained about Nimbin is because I want people to get an understanding that we are talking about a culture and many alternative cultures. Some of them are completely natural. I'm not talking about them. I'm just talking about a lot of them that I know that are like this. They have had a fairly big drug history. Now this Morgan that I've talked about I mean he's got the the classic alcoholic nose and I didn't say anything you know well I thought oh well so what you know I, I don't want to judge people by that even though I've got good reason to because my father was an alcoholic his parents were, were alcoholics and all his brothers and sisters were alcoholics so I've seen yeah I know what they do and I know how much they lie and how good a con men they are. I mean, if anyone's experienced an alcoholic, you know how they will con you to get what they want. And they become really good con men. Now, this Morgan has got the classic Elko looking nose. I mean, he doesn't have the gut. A lot of them that are, are skinny end up the opposite. I mean, there's a lot that end up with that big, big gut but there's also a lot that don't and some end up with these cauliflower nose the classic alcoholic nose and sure enough I'd come across a video where he actually said that he was and I thought well yeah I kind of figured that and he talked about his life of pretty much sex drugs and rock and roll where he didn't give a, a shit about anybody else you know he was just partying, cruising around the world and doing his own thing. And then that was taken all away from him. So he ended up back at where he was following his curiosities. So uh, the people that I have met at these communities, I have seen in, in Nimbun and that are offering these uh, land parcels to buy into, into this company that is the community. Uh, I, I just want people to understand that even though there is a tribal philosophy there and the mindset and the goal of it is towards that um, philosophy, there is a very practical and legal side that it is still all a company. Someone had to buy that land and that land has to be registered under title somewhere and it has been set up as a business. There have to be directors who own that business. Now the people that buy in, that are buying shares, this is where you hear of distribution where you might have say three major shareholders who hold between them 51% of the vote and they create shares for the other 49% and someone buying in might get 1% share in the company and it might cost them you know 50,000 to buy in for it. 
So for their 50,000, they'll get their... I'm not saying that's an amount. Uh, this is a hypothetical. Uh, I'm just saying this is how it works, that you buy in uh, of the, for a share for the company at a particular price, and what you get for it is the land and the ability to build your house and the cooperation of the community and the support of the community. And as I said, the ideals that they've got going there, they really do sound wonderful. But there are more and more people during this COVID era that might be looking towards going towards these alternative communities and investing the last cents that they've got left before they lose anything to try and become self-sustainable. Now, one thing I've noticed in a lot of these communities, I mean, you'll find drumming circles, you'll find fire pits, you'll find fire twirlings, you'll find guitars and banjos and artwork and, you know, music studios and art studios and galleries, but I never found the communities where there was that sustainability. Because for me, self-sustainability starts with food. And then the next thing after that is creating self-sustainability with energy. And that has been one of the biggest focus in the back of my mind and trying to find a way of how do we provide energy for ourselves. But anyway, I'm getting off subject there. So, um, sorry, another interruption and I got uh, sidetracked again. But uh, the ownership of the land is a crucial issue when it comes to establishing a, a peaceful community. And how that land is controlled by what value system, they are two different things. In some cases, it is native title and native law. So both the law, so who has legal control of the land or technically owns the land and who controls the land is all tribal and then there are situations where it is law that is under Australian law it's registered as a business with the operational philosophy of tribal law and it's it's a good ideal to want to try and integrate and bring those things together because we've got enough divides we do need to, to bring people together more. But there is also this issue that with the distribution of shares and who controls what and how much they've contributed money-wise has a big deal, to a lot to do with how entitled someone feels and eventually ego is going to come into play. Now, I'm going to get a little bit sidetracked here and tell you that after I'd experienced this, these alternative communities, I listened to the Billy Meyer tapes. And there was talk there of where he was told to set up a community to bring in people to get them to contribute, you know, uh, financially and to build this community around this common mindset and I thought oh you know that's the ideal but I don't think this is going to end well well it didn't end well and it got to the stage where Billy Meyer wanted to walk away from it all because the amount of money that someone has contributed to something is the amount of entitlement or pull that they think that their opinion should hold so if someone who holds one percent share says something and you know this other person holds ten percent share that person that holds ten percent says well I've contributed more to this so I deserve more so and as idyllic as you want it to be it and this was a community that all had the same mindset and values. And in the end, 
It was the money and the ownership over the land that pulled them completely apart. So only if the land is free, and that is how it should actually be. If we are to go by our common law right, no man can own anything except himself. There is nothing on this planet that you can possess, nothing. The, what, what you can possess is what you can take with you when you die. What can you take with you when you die? That's all you possess. So you better hope you're spiritual and you believe in something so you get to take something when you die. But anyway, that's it. Again, I'm getting off subject. I am really sorry. I'm just trying to bring it together in the way that people can, well, not only try and understand the experiences that I've had that have brought me to these conclusions and how it all ties in together, but that you might be able to tie it in together yourself by looking at the things that I have said because I do not think that like these are all alternative thinkers in these communities they are people that are looking for a way outside of the system they don't want to live inside this matrix and they are they're well known for this they are a prime target to be infiltrated and manipulated controlled or whatever in some kind of way and if what happened at the, the Billy Meyer community, I've seen it happen in other communities, it pulls people apart. If you cannot hold um, equal share in opinions, there will always be someone that says, well, this is my company, I own more of it than you, and I'm not going to let you, who owns only a little small part, have a bigger say than me. There is always that division. So the only way to stop any of that is to stop ownership of the land at all and actually revert back to the original Aboriginal philosophy of not owning the land but belonging to it. And if we all wanted to live in harmony with each other, we have to stop saying that this is my slice of land. It is not. You can't own the land. It, I mean, it is an impossible concept. If you own it, take it with you when you die. You can't. You don't own it. It is merely the illusion you are a long-term renter. You are here for a little bit of a ride, and then you're gone. And if you believe in... Uh, reincarnation you'll come back again but that's a, again sorry off subject so this community is n that I've talked about where they've set up this corporation and everything I've also I've listened to their promo and I've also found an interview that was done with the guy that actually bought all that land and bought it all together and made it happen and there's also a part of when you buy into that you get shares of the business they do actually talk about other businesses in their promo but they don't say what it is but in the interview uh, they talk about that these other businesses is a shop a garage a hemp farm and an art gallery so and and how that works from looking at their video on how um, when you're buying into it is that each month the dividends out of the business go into a fund and at the end of the year um, that's divided up amongst the shareholders so you get a, a, a yearly bonus pretty much and other than that for your buy-in you've got your land and your home and if it works as the ideal and it is reality and it works out and everything just booms and goes forward and doesn't look back which I really hope it does you know none of the fact that it's a business will have to matter but ultimately the fact that it is a business the fact that it has got a corporate structure and it is still 
very much centered around money, income and capitalism. The philosophy of living the, on the, the land is kind of in contradiction to that. So as long as you've got that contradiction, there's always going to be the risk that it's going to fall apart because, well, they say opposites attract, but sometimes uh, they don't sit well together and it all just comes undone. So I'm going to leave it at that anyway because uh, I think I've talked enough and said enough things. I put notes down in front of me because I forget to say so many things and I also get sidetracked on the different things so that I don't... I might start to make a point, get sidetracked on explaining another and then forget where I was. And tonight I've been interrupted a few times by um, things so that hasn't helped any. And uh, yeah, so I don't want to say too much more about any of these. I don't want to make any more videos of it. So I just want to try and cover everything in this one. That um, all the alternative mindset that looks to alternative media and the alternative media that is also got these MK Ultra operatives that have infiltrated them and I'm use, I've been using Australia as an example but I dare say no matter where you are in the world you're going to find that there is some example of it I mean before there was even a name for the new age movement I was a new ager and I thought oh this is great you know finally I can start talking to people about certain things but then I found that it, it got stuck in this bubble of, of information that, you know, they were happy to know this much and that was as far as it went because it was a profitable business, it's what people wanted to hear and it's where I turned completely away from the new age and all that stuff because it, it, it became too commercial. And also I knew that there were so many people out there like... I, I'm a very open-minded person. I've listened to, listened to channelers that, you know, I, I get this get the connection that they are coming up with something real, and then you get others. It's like you can almost see him holding the earpiece in his ear, getting fed the information that he's saying, and it's like, well, if you're channeling a higher being, you know what? I don't want to hear from them because they're pretty grumpy and nasty, and you know. If you want to channel a higher being, I want, you know, I don't want you to talk like someone that is unenlightened. I mean, he's pretty much of an obvious fake, but there are so many people out there that buy his bullshit, I can't believe it. There is others that are, are a little bit better at it than, than some, but... So there's a lot of different subjects I look at out there because of my own personal experiences. I've had many experiences that I can't explain and I've gone looking for the answers but as I said I've pretty much brought it full circle gone off track and taken you in lots of different directions that had nothing to do with any of this but yeah talk to you again another time bye